of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out today and sharing this great message into 21st century agriculture. I'm thrilled to be on this panel, asked to moderate this, because if you look at this, every other moderator has been in academia, and although I have what I call two and a half degrees, I appreciate the fact that a commoner like me was invited to participate in the Ag Tech Summit, so thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to introduce to you Matt. Matt, if you want to take a few seconds, I know she gave you a, a little bit brief demo. If you want to go a little bit more into the weeds, pardon the pun, about some of your agriculture background. And then, obviously, more of what you have to say we will cover in the questioning. Sure. Yeah, hi, everybody. My name is Matt Riggs. Um, first off, I want to say thanks to Brian in the last talk. I can tell you, um, he was getting a lot of amens uh, in the back because uh, he brought up some really great points about small farms and um, our concerns about the system and the progress not really keeping uh, the small operations in mind. And, and I think I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But I was, I was really happy to hear that because I come from a small family farm. Uh, we farm 316 acres down in the southeast corner of the county. Um, my family's been farming there since 1874, and uh, just like Brian said, uh, the, our, the system was kind of broke when it came time for me to make a decision where, where I wanted to go as a young adult. Um, didn't have a lot of great options uh, regarding the farm, and I really wanted there to be options. Uh, strong emotional attachment to the ground um, led me uh, to the University of Illinois as an undergrad. Um, the military for several years after that, and then uh, came back full circle, able to um, kind of realize my my dream that I'd had for for a very long time, which was to become a specialty processor of grain that we grow on our farm um, in the form of a fairly widely adopted and beloved product, beer. Um, so that's that's how we've been able to kind of artificially inject more profitability into our otherwise routinely unprofitable uh, family farm as by uh, some unique niche vertical integration. Um, so yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Awesome, thank you. Lena, would you like to be next and share with us about your awesomeness? Absolutely. Good afternoon. I'm Lena Head. I am a co-owner and external relations manager for Head Brothers Land and Cattle. We're a fourth uh, generation family farming operation that operates um, in Christian, Macon, and Logan counties. So right here in central Illinois. Truthfully, I just made up the title external relations manager. We don't really have job titles at the farm. Uh, but we do all have strengths uh, where we kind of lend them to our specialization. So my role really is in handling those external partnerships, whether that be trials or beta testing with various companies, um, or really just handling all the communication with landlords and input suppliers. Um, that is, of course, when I'm not moonlighting as our best third shift grain cart operator um, in my night and weekends. Um, outside of the farming operation, though, I do work full-time, and I've uh, had a great career in both corporate agribusiness, um, working for one of the large equipment manufacturers, and now working in the ag tech startup space as well. Excellent. Thank you. Mark, share with us about your background. Uh, well, first of all, it's great to be here. Um, I grew up on a farm in central Illinois uh, near Bloomington. Um, went to the University of Illinois, of course, and uh, uh, graduated from there and always had an interest in kind of agribusiness, but also the farming side. So I wasn't quite sure when I graduated what I wanted to do. So reality hit me and said, you're going to take the first job you can get, and that was in banking. And so I got into banking, but the biggest thing is, over the years, uh, my family's developed a farming operation. And it's been centered around one thing, and that's creating value at the farm gate. And I want to, I want to kind of accentuate what the first two individuals have said: farming, farming, and creating value is not size. It doesn't matter how big your farm is; it's what you create. And I was listening to the people talking this last one, you know, and I've kind of been working on trying to uh, save myself into prosperity. Meaning, I'm going to buy all this equipment and I'm going to do it cheaper and everything else. But the one thing was, in the 80s, I realized ADM didn't want to buy my grain for much more than a buck fifty. 
So what I really had to do is what these guys are talking about, is create value at the farm gate. And I think that's the one thing we miss in farming today. We're not, we're not size bound. We're actually bound by an industry that's really, really productive and essential. And so today, when you talk about people, when you talk about technology, when you talk about what we're going to do at the farm gate, it's not in any way bound by size. It's not bound by basically what we're doing. It's what we're creating. And the biggest thing is, does someone always want to buy it? So we sit here, we figure out how to do corn cheaper. Sometimes they don't want to buy it. What's that get us? So I applaud what they're doing. And in our family operation, we have tried to create value at the farm gate. So today we're a 5,000 acre cash grain operation, corn, beans, wheat, cattle, hay, wheat, beans, corn. And also we have a cash grain operation that's an export company where we export all our grain and about another 150,000 acres of grain to the Orient. You know what's kind of amazing? They like that information. That's how we create value, at the farm gate, not at my tractor seat. So Mark, this is the first time the panel has met in person since 2020, Ag Tech Summit. During the disruption of the pandemic, what lessons did you learn, challenges and opportunities that you were able to build upon during the disruption? Wow, it was monumental. Actually, it started first like how you deal with your employees, how you treat them, how do you manifest a future for them? Because it was a thing of, it wasn't just their health, which was the paramount, but it was how do we build a future for them that they're safe, they feel comfortable. And you know, they, there's no doubt they kind of got into the thing of, well, maybe I don't want to come to work every day. But that's kind of hard to do in farming. So we actually turned over two thirds of our workforce. And it wasn't us saying, see ya, it was they left. But the interesting thing was, is it was what it did for us. And what we learned was, we got to figure out how we become more relevant to our employees. The biggest thing we asked was, what do you want coming back? We tried to fulfill that. Did we do it completely? No. But the pandemic actually turned us to things like the following. We always tried to, can we, can we get them for $15 an hour? We went to, can we hire someone that provides a service for us that ultimately can be paid for? I'll give you an example. Put one person into the farm who then works in the grain side. Loves it. So I think there's two things. Understanding what they want. How do you help them build a future? And in building that future, how do you build a business? Was it easy? Have we done it? Well, it wasn't easy. They're still there, so I guess we've done it. But that was, that was kind of amazing. When it, we, it was kind of a problem, but it ultimately be a change moment for us in our business. Thank you. Matt, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I got two separate answers. On the, on the family farming operation, I, actually, COVID didn't affect us very much at all. Uh, we could socially distance from the cab of the tractor and, um, you know, supply chains, uh, you know, on, on, on farm parts and supplies, yeah, we saw some inflation, but really, honestly, there wasn't a huge uh, disruption to the, to the family farm operation. Um, to the to brewery side, yeah, massive disruption. Uh, we were a draft-only brewery, um, so kegs only at that point in time, and we very quickly had to shift into a package that people um, could take home. Um, some dedicated drinkers out there do take kegs home, but that's a very small segment. <laughs> God bless you for, for those of you who do. But whoop, whoop. We, we had, to, uh, we had to, sh to shift pretty heavy on that side, but uh, one of the advantages of being a small uh, company, family owned, is we were very nimble, very quick to react, and we could make very decisive decisions quickly. And, and uh, I don't want to have to relive you know, that two-year period, but uh, we survived it. We're, I think we're stronger because of it, and uh, let's, let's not do it again. But yeah, so two totally different uh, impacts. On the farm side, not much, but on the, on the brewery side, quite a, quite a bit, but we, we managed. Yeah, thanks for sharing your significant uh, experience. Lena, what's your insight? 
From our standpoint, similar to what Matt said, it was it was really business as usual from an operational standpoint on the farm. One thing that it really did change was kind of our strategy for parts and service and really trying to get better at planning ahead because getting those parts and service was compromised during that time. And it's that is definitely something that we've carried through um, forward in our operation and we stock a whole lot more parts on premises um, and have taken the liberty to really learn to do a lot more of our own service work where possible. Outside of that, it was uh, Tons of demand for freezer beef locally. If those of you that experience challenges getting um, meat in the stores, um, since we have a cattle operation, that we did see a ton of uh, interest from local customers there. Reminds me of a saying, and pardon me if I don't say it exactly correct. Innovation is a mother. Necessity. necessity is the mother of in in innovation and ingenuity. So, congrats to all of you to taking that opportunity and moving forward in a positive direction. As we shift to discussing technology, what barriers, Matt, have you fa faced implementing advanced technology as it evolves in your operation, and how have you overcome it? Yeah, significant um, barriers, namely scale. We lack scale. Um, we lack the capital to invest in a lot of the stuff that I heard discussed today doesn't apply to my 1989 uh, tractor. It was built in 1989. That's, that's the newest uh, tractor I've got. My, my combine's a 1993 model. So um, a lot of these technologies, and in business at large, I think it's also important to be able to also say no to things that don't actually make sense to your application. It takes some discipline, because you want to say yes to cool, fun stuff. But a lot of times, there's even more value in saying no this doesn't apply to my specific application. Um, you know, I got a John Deere 7000 series planter that, that's uh, older than I am, and it plants corn really well. I don't, on my small operation, I don't need to see a couple percent increase. Um, it doesn't justify me spending $80,000 on, on a planter upgrade. Um, so there are significant barriers for small farms. It takes discipline to say no to the things that don't make sense. It doesn't mean that no, no is the right answer to everything. Um, you know, we, we've got bolt-on GPS now in the tractors, uh, aftermarket bolt-on that saves us um, a bunch of efficiency-wise time, time and fuel costs. Um, but that did, that didn't we didn't we didn't get in on generation one of that technology. It's a lot of a lot more affordable when you get it 20 years later, and sometimes that's the right answer for a small producer. You know what, sometimes the bright, shiny objects aren't the ones that give you the best ROI. And I like to have pencils that operate in the black, not in the red. So to your point, Mark, what are your thoughts? Oh, this 20 years later comment really kind of gets me because there's a lot of truth in that. But this is one that's always, like if you are someone, and Matt, take this as a compliment. When you're starting out like he is and trying to make it go and make it work, the, the ultimate asset in his life to me is, is innovation and desire to make it go. So you're always struggling with like, well, I need you go to meetings and you hear the newest, the best, and the whiz bang and everything else. But his focus has to be on how am I gonna make a business work? So the one thing I've always lacked, I've never lacked on having the latest GPS. What I've lacked is people around me to help me figure out how I create value and how I move it forward. And I think if I were going to, in, in, for me, in my life, if I could have had more of that in my life, I would have been a lot more successful. And, you know, technology today is usually it feels like it's always got to be a screen on my tractor or something buzzing in my phone, when in reality, the marriage between the two and helping me get my product out and do it better and everything else is a big deal. So I'm not, I'm not sure that goes right down the path of what you're talking about, but what I'm trying to do is draw it to how at the end of the day, how do, these, how do all of us make money with what we've got in the world today. 
And you know what? The planner gets it done. But you've got the product. How do you take it from there? Right. And, and that's not to say that farmers that have scale shouldn't be implementing some of these new technologies because they have the scale where the ROI is there. But, but to have the, 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 the discipline to say, you know, that's, this product isn't for me right now, um, I, think, I think that's important. But then on the other side of our business, um, you know, I've got some, some pieces of equipment um, that are highly technologically advanced and very expensive, but I need that to make my very high value product so the ROI is, is really quick. That's on, on the brewery side. So sorting through what technologies to, to, to bring on and which ones to, to wait on, I think is an important skill. Oh, it is. And I, one thing in ag today, you know, one thing I, I, I have nothing against big ag. I, I, heck, I don't know, maybe I am big ag. But we also need to figure out in America how we utilize our technology to be an rateable, affordable, consistent demand for food in the world. So there's these different markets. I, the one thing I'm always taken aback by is we tend to kind of talk about ag this way, and both of you prove it's, it's more layered, and it's more productive, and it's more advantageous to the com consuming community. So the previous panel on intelligent farms summarized the importance of data, technology, and digital usage. But the one thing I've heard on all the panels across the board, and we're alluding to here, is you cannot take away and recreate the human element, the passion and the heart of who we are in our chosen industry, where we've come from, where we want to be, and where we move forward in the future. Lena, share with us your experiences. Do you want me to restate the question? OK. Uh, what barriers have you faced implementing advanced technology in your operation? How have you overcome them? So it's kind of ironic for us, considering I work in technology adoption space. But ownership and really driving that adoption home is a thing that we have challenge, been challenged with in the past. I think we all have probably experienced where we bought a gym membership, and we then didn't use it. And so it's really easy to have the same thing happen when you make investments in various um, apps or tools in your operation. Your day-to-day -day is so busy that if you don't make an intentional move to use them, um, you, you might not see that ROI or get that value out of the tool. From our standpoint, we have kind of appointed there has to be an internal champion or owner of any new technology or processes that we take on. And those people are responsible for, number one, making sure that the, the whole team is adopting it, whether that means training our part-time team on how to use the grain cart app that tracks um, where all of the bushels of our grain go during harvest, or um, making sure that our team that runs the feed wagon and feeds cattle is also utilizing the nutritional program correctly there. If you don't make an effort to truly use some of these tools, you're not going to see the value. And so for us, it really has been being really conscious about adoption within our operation. Thank you. Mark, there was a previous panel that discussed the challenges of the workforce soliciting uh, new employees, career development, and uh, jobs. How, um, as all these forms of laborers relate to the ag value chain or under stress, what makes you hopeful for the future of the ag tech workforce? Well, first of all, we've got a great, great story to sell. I just, I'm always, you know, I grew up in what they call the fert and dirt group, fertilizer, dirt, et cetera. Looking out around here, I don't see a lot of gray hair, so I figure most of you are a lot younger than me. One of the great things about agriculture is it's the base of so many things. And it's not just, you know, you live by food. It's technology today. It's, it's philosophy. It's whatever. It's policy. It's everything. And when you see people start to think about an increase in food price, it kind of goes to, well, eggs got cheap because of a bird flu, and we can't get trucks moving. So if you're thinking about a career in the future, 
where can you be involved with something that's so important and so intrinsic to everyone? And you can sell it as you got to eat it, you can burn it, you can grow it, you have technology, and it's, it's STEM in its most basic manifestation. So this, this happened out of the pandemic. We had to figure out how we sell what we do in a different way. And I've been involved with the Kersey Foundation in East St. Louis with young black kids. And one of the things that hit me the most, I had a grand, grandmotherly black lady one day come up to me, we we're trying to grow corn in St. Louis, which was, that was a jewel. And she goes, you know, you know that farming thing didn't work out too good for us the first time. And I was like, ooh. And she goes, but boy, we still, as a community and a culture, love it and are, want to be a part of it. So to answer your question, don't get too hung up on computers and widgets. Get hung up in what the industry is. And you know what's kind of amazing? The generation I see today really, really want to understand that. So I think it's our job in, in trying to get people involved. There's a lot of people like to drink beer. A lot of people like to eat beef. So figure out how you make that mainstream in the future of a lot of young people. And that's sort of what we've done. I think Mark really hit the nail on the head there with the we do have a great story tell. And when I was um, spent some time in Research Park, it's one that I told often to students because they really do want to make an impact in the world. And there really is no better way to make a bigger impact than working in agriculture because it is so vital to our um, livelihood. I think outside of that, what excites me really is just the diversity of thought that is coming to the industry from the, the vast differences in talent that we're starting to be able to bring into the pipeline. I think it's going to be really vital to us solving, solving problems in the future. Um, but then the last thing I'll mention, I think the more UX designers that we can bring into this industry, I think the better. Usability is such a huge topic for growers. Um, they are not shy about doing things the hard way if uh, whatever technology you've provided isn't easy and incredibly intuitive. And I think we're going to need a lot more um, designers and user experience that are going to help build tools that truly are just so un unexplanatory, um, easy to use. Matt, do you have anything to add? Yeah, from, from a uh, labor standpoint, I'd say my perspective is a little bit skewed in, in that, you know, I've got two major advantages. One, um, both on the farm and the brewery side, we're small companies, so we can, there's a certain type of person that wants to work for a small company, so we're already kind of, an attractive option for somebody who, who wants to stay out of a, a corporate type of environment. There's there's folks that gravitate towards that, and that's fine. Um, but for folks that, that want to work for literally a, a family-owned and operated small company, um, that, that makes it uh, us more attractive than we'd normally be um, or the average company would be. And then secondly, um, free beer is part of the uh, compensation package. That appeals to a certain segment of the population. Are you hiring? <laughs> We're, we're actually currently full right now, and I think that maybe the combination of those two things uh, is the reason why. So I run cattle on my family farm that I've been at since 1975, and uh, I come from the small town of Chenoa, just north of Bloomington, and Chenoa just opened a, a microbrew in the last three months, and so they bring their wet grains out and, and feed my cattle. Um, they don't like to drink beer, they just like to eat the wet grains after the beer's already brewed. So I'm, I'm kind of happy that, you know, the cattle have since gone to harvest, but that being said, I like the fact that we can integrate these small businesses into running cattle and, and raising calves on a what's now considered a small hobby farm, so I, I enjoy that perspective of it. Um, as we talk about and continue to unpack the human element, a lot of people in previous panels, I heard somebody talk about the different personalities and different emotional types of people out in the workforce, and, and you hit the nail on the head when you said there are people out there through their personalities that want to work for smaller businesses, and that is one of the things we need to look at when we are hiring 
you know, are they team players? Are they more introverted? Are they more extroverted? I taught for 12 years, and so I had to go through that whole Myers-Briggs thing, which I'm sure all the ed educators in academia here in the room know what I'm talking about to figure out who you are as your personality type and how you're going to handle your students. But there are the introverted are... Um, shy, they used to be called shy, people that, that like to work in those specialty crops, smaller um, uh, platforms that are more to their personal liking. Not everybody's a type A extroverted extrovert. That would be me. And um, so that's, that's awesome that we have the choice here in the United States to bring everybody to the table to meet all the different parts of agriculture. I just gave a presentation last night at a, at a at a women's club and tried to teach them what food was and, and where their food came from because anybody that's interested in eating should be interested in agriculture. So it's exciting that we have the tech component of it uh, for the agriculture industry, but also the, the small entrepreneurial spirit. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, our end products, what we make, everyone has to consume. They don't even have an option. So. Uh, we should be, I think, even more present in everyone's mind because this is, this is not an industry where people have a, the option to not consume from. So uh, our, our audience is literally every human, and, and then you, know, all, you could follow this down to, to, to livestock and everything there, but literally every person on the planet needs to consume daily from us. Um, so that, that means our audience is big, and I, th I think we, we, we definitely can improve on um, position ourselves more in, in the forefront of, of consumers' minds. Um, and it's gonna happen. The younger generation is already shifting that way. We are more uh, in the forefront in their minds. But I thought that that was an interesting point to make that, that uh, you know, there's a lot of other industries out there where not, you know, maybe 1% of the public consumes or maybe half of the public, but literally every human is consuming daily what we make. Absolutely. And um, as we figure out how to feed the increasing population of the whole world, 50% uh, of the world's population lives within a five-hour plane ride from Hong Kong. So Asia is a huge market that we look forward to in helping the largest production of agriculture here in the United States through the use of technology. Unpacking that, um, the gentleman that was on the previous panel that um, was the pilot, <laughs> I actually remember TWA. Um, he was talking about uh, the, the use of that and what does it look like if we take these carbon credits and we build this land and then somebody, it's yanked out underneath us. So Lena, as we talk about carbon credits and we talk about future opportunities, what information do you have to share with us possibly about even looking at uh, pumping carbon un underground? So it's a topic we discuss often in our operation. I would say to date, our stance is kind of, we're not sure if the, the orange is worth the squeeze on carbon credits. So we're really waiting it out and seeing what happens there, hoping that there becomes some more structure around that space, um, the monetization of it becomes a lot easier, and those barriers go down. Um, locally, though, in, in both Christian and Macon counties, there's a lot of de discussion about geological so sequestration of carbon. Um, there are, I'm no geologist, so take it for what it's worth, but there are specific rock formations in those counties that make it possible to sequester carbon um, deep down under the ground. And so there are going to be opportunities for growers in that space. Um, if you have your farm ground sits on top of those um, wells, there could be some potential um, payments that you can receive. And then, of course, there is potentially a pipeline that's going to be built to start funneling carbon to those wells as well. And so that may be one opportunity for, for growers to monetize um, some payments, but it's something we're kind of keeping an eye on since it's definitely in our backyard. Do either of you two gentlemen have any additional experience or feedback you'd like to briefly share? I'd say from the small producer side, carbon credits aren't something that I'm very excited about at this point, just due to the limited economic impact it'd have our, on our operation. Um, there, there are other environmental incentives that I think are much more exciting, even for a small producer. Um, anything from you know the consumer side of getting, getting a uh, some type of an 
additional value associated with how that product was raised on the farm and went through the supply chain, I think there's more upside to that, being like a certified producer. The STAR program, I think, is a really great one where, you know, it's easy for, for consumers to understand one through five, STAR rating. And, and so I think there's more potential there for upside for a small producer. And then also uh, from renewable energy uh, standpoint, integrating that into a farm operation, I think there's a lot more upside um, th that I'm more excited about than carbon. Um, on the carbon side, we, we've been very interested in. We started 10 years ago with wheat, bean, corn rotations, which was our cover crop. So we had wheat every other year. The biggest thing was trying to figure out how you have, first of all, the foliage, you know, from the sequestration standpoint, I guess. How do you make money with it? And then how do you improve the soil? On the Cover crop side, we've never made any money with cover crops. You want to say dollar in, dollar out, we've lost money. But on the whole, has it helped soil structure and things like that, which made us money later? That's true. Our farm as a whole, we were the first in McLean County near Ellsworth, Illinois, and my brother and I and another guy put up 500 windmills with uh, the Zilka family out of uh, Houston, and the windmill things work very well for us on a renewable side. It's been a great, actually, the checks are one thing, but the, having a lane into your farm every year to take trucks out of it was just as big on compaction and helping soil. We're looking at solar and how do you either graze under it, how do you put them in with Duke Energy, that's going very slow. Um, but I generally believe when you think about the sequestration of carbon through plants, agriculture probably ought to put more thought into how do you develop a revenue stream out of a plant than putting another piece of metal. Well, and, and that's an interesting point because I myself, for, for my little track of land, has looked at that and I've heard a lot of talk today about the little guys versus big ag. Well, I'm a little guy, but boy, oh boy, that, you know, my pasture has been grazed with, with no petroleum-based products and could be certified organic in raising my beef, but nobody wants 10 acres. Well, I like my 10 acres, you know, and if I uh, put pen to paper and did solid management, I could do agroforestry while grazing, which increases additional carbon inputs, but because I don't have an extra zero to, or two after my 10 acres, they're like, whatever. So um, that it's... I've been keeping an eye on it for at least five years when the, when the word came out there and people started generating the conversation. So it continues to be an evolving uh, concept, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, within the farming and agriculture community. So hopefully as it continues to build and develop, uh, we will continue to know more for the big guys and the little guys or girls. Um, so in talking about renewables, you had mentioned, uh, I guess we could call them wind farms, I like to call them turbines. Uh, south, 10 miles south of my farm, I've got the red bl blinking lights. 10 miles north, I've got the red blinking lights. 10 miles to the west, I got the red blinking lights. On a dark, starry night on my farm, I feel like uh, space invaders or, you know, <laughs> like they're coming in and landing with the red blinking lights everywhere. But wind energy is a renewable that's been hitting it hard. So now that we talk about solar farming and agrivoltaics, which they've been doing a lot of research here on campus, Matt, what are your thoughts on agrivoltaics, what that means as far as solar? And I have to share with you, Illinois Farm Bureau has come out against solar farms. So, you know, we're covering up tillable land. It's, it's starting to become a controversial issue. And we all know here, Illinois, going up against Ukraine, has some of the most fertile land in the world. 
Yeah, so I mean, first, the, the point I'd like to make is that my great-great-grandfather, uh, his farm looked different than our farm. Even though it's the same chunk of ground, it looks very different from when he was farming. You know, there, there were oats and windbreaks and all sorts of livestock, and we've changed. And, and the change is probably never going to stop. It's probably only going to get faster. And so the argument that, you know, we're changing the landscape and that's, that's the wrong thing to do, I, I think, well, <laughs> When have we not changed the landscape? When have we not adapted? You know, the tall grass prairie that was here 300 years ago looks different than what we've got now. So I don't think it's a problem that the landscape doesn't need to look like corn and soybeans and row crop for the next 100 years. I don't think it's realistic to expect that all of the land will look like that. So um, I'm very optimistic about the future of uh, renewables. Uh, the argument that, you know, taking prime farmland out of production is a bad idea, I, I think that's nonsense. I think, you know, one acre of solar, I've, I've done a little bit of looking into it. We're looking seriously at, at some options on converting uh, some acres, not all of them, but some of the acres to complement the farm. When you account for all this, the energy inputs and what the energy delivered to society, um, there's been some pretty well-researched uh, claims that solar can deliver about 85 times the value per acre of what ethanol production can. And we heard the stat earlier today that 45% of American corn goes to ethanol production. Um, I don't think those two things in, in combination, conjunction, uh, kind of destroy the argument that we're going to have people go hungry if we put some acres into um, electrical production, right? If we can be, if we can deliver 85 times the amount of energy to society versus a a, uh, a use that is is using up 45 percent of our entire corn production, that is a highly efficient uh, reward or uh, yield, and and you know we should we should very seriously uh, think about shifting shifting those acres out. And this is not a permanent change, you know. If you get 35 years of, of agrivoltaic usage where, you know, you can you could still even farm that ground under those panels in a different way, probably more like my great-great-grandfather did, you know, with, with some sheep or, or some other uh, livestock or some maybe some small specialty crops that require a little bit more labor. Um, to me, this is a, a great way to save family farms. Um, small operations like mine should be looking at this and thinking, this is how we keep people employed. Um, if This is how we can compete against really large operations. If I can guarantee every year a, a certain payment from electrical production, and then because I'm not a massive row crop operation that has giant scale and, and needs 10,000 acres to justify all the infrastructure that I've built, because I can say, hey, my infrastructure doesn't need that. I can do some of this uh, smaller, more more niche production. I think I think that is the recipe to keep the next generation of of small farms in business, and keep all the small towns. You know, my small town of Broadlands. Nobody there is even related to the to the ag industry anymore. Everybody that lives in that small town down there only lives there because it's the cheapest rent in the county. And if we could get a bunch of agrivoltaic um, installations, maybe even prefer preferentially given to small family farms that want to stay on the land and farm it, not only do we keep those farms in business, but then we've got a whole bunch of associated decent paying jobs that could keep people in the small towns and breathe some life back into them. Well, that's an interesting point because when the... Um wind turbines moved into Ch Chinoa, <laughs> the rental rates increased on the half a dozen apartment buildings that we have in town. And so when things like that uh, breathe extra life into these small farming communities that over the course of decades, as they've been saying, small towns are dying, it just hopefully helps renovate them and rejuvenate them. Lena, do you have any experience or thoughts on uh, these agrivoltaics or the solar farms or any of those items that we just discussed? I would say there's no shortage of opportunities for those that are interested. I think we get at least one letter a month from some solar company or another. Um, we truthfully haven't pulled the trigger and, and jumped in yet ourselves. I think 
from a livestock standpoint, it's probably more of interest there if there was, if the, the equipment could withstand a cattle using it as a scratching post, I would have no issues putting that out in, in our pastures. We have 500 acres of pasture ground and I think a dual purpose use would be great, but I do think there's probably some work to be done there, so. Well, thank you, Mark. Any thoughts? And old enough, I remember windmills on the farm and all that. And I, I'm always kind of a little taken aback by we tore them all down. Now people don't like them coming back up. But I'm thinking, oof, this is kind of weird. Because we used to use it for getting water out of the ground, stuff like that. I, I'll give you the thought process my wife and I went through thinking about, and my family, my brother and his wife. There was Clinton Nuclear Power Plant in Clinton, Illinois. They had a big power line going into Chicago. It goes downtown around Wrigley Field, actually. And we're sitting there, and we actually had a conversation amongst us about our kids, and would you rather have nuclear, or would you rather have wind? And it really kind of came down to just thinking about sustainability of energy in what we, at that time, sort of thought was a clean way of doing it. So it didn't have actually any agricultural aspect to it. It was more what feels right, you know, for the energy future of where we're at. But then it became, okay, now you're going to have all these windmills out here. And I grew up on a farm. We had corn, beans, wheat, uh, no, oats, alfalfa, cattle. We had a rotation. So size has nothing to do with it. What we're doing is we're trying to figure out how to recreate those things we did on the smaller farms in the past and we can do on larger farms. So for me, this whole, whether you're putting solar panels and you're putting sheep through them or goats underneath, or you're getting them apart, we've been through this, can we bail it down the middle? It's kind of how do we get back to that kind of thing, and I will tell all of you, the thing that frustrates me about egg, we have not done a very good job. You know, we always talk about we want more alfalfa, and we want more of this, and you know, the carbon's better in the summer, but none of us have done a really good job of trying to figure out how to put a plant out there that makes money. If you really want to put money into something, figure out how to get a plant that makes money. Because if you do that, and you get carbon sequestration, that's a pretty excuse me, damn good deal. And we can talk, we can have widgets in the combines and everything else, but if you really want to connect this, so when I think about our farm, and whether it's solar or whatever, I haven't heard another good answer, so I'm trying to make certain that my farm is an environmentally correct the best I can and I don't give it, I don't care if it's three acres or 300,000 acres. How do I do that? And right now I've, I've not been given a better answer. Ian, I just want to clarify that I'm not advocating for what, I, what I've kind of seen in the first big phase of utility scale solar installs where they fence it off and then pay people to mow it. I think that's equally as foolish as saying that there's no use for any solar panels. Both of those are extremes. They're, like most things, like there's a really complex, nuanced solution somewhere in the messy middle that makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. And I've yet to see wide scale adoption of that, but I think in the next five years, we're absolutely gonna see that and it's gonna be all over the place. And I think that could be a huge win for small farmers if they embrace it and say, you know what, I'm actually more tied to this land now than I was when I was driving my GPS steered tractor uh, doing row crop farming. I'm actually more in touch with it because I'm down there, you know, doing, doing a hay operation, right? Hay prices, if you put $1,100 an acre cash rent plus, plus hay production, um, I'm sorry, John Deere and Cargill and all the other uh, like larger companies, that demolishes the profitability of even the largest farm with the best technology. Um, and a small farmer can compete there. And that emotional attachment of being connected to that ground, I think will be even tighter because you're literally, it's gonna be a more intensive type of farming, um, but I think it's definitely worth trying to figure it out. 
Well, and that's an interesting point because everybody uh, here in central Illinois remembers what the weather was like over Christmas. Um, 35 mile an hour winds, 50 below wind chill, or was it 50 mile an hour winds and 35 below wind chill? I don't care. Anytime you get below zero, it's cold. And this girl was hauling hay and straw out to the barn because the calves weren't scheduled for harvest until January 10th. And let me tell you, how much I had to pay for hay and straw, $5 a bale, because it took a week to find anybody that even does hay and straw anymore. And I'm thinking, wh where did all of the cattle and horse people go, at least around Chenoa, Fairbury, Forest, you know, my little whole area, Pontiac, because, um, because of, of the two cropping system. And so to be able to diversify, find that return on investment, even if you're a small guy, to make your, uh, make your best uh, management structure. So as I said before, there's a place at the table for everybody, no matter what your farming style is. Um, there's a whole lot of um, options for people to take what they want today and leave the rest. And it is time for questions. There we go. Uh, so Matt and Lena, both of you talked about creating local or niche markets for your products that add value at the farm. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your approaches to that? I know that could be probably a whole panel in and of itself, but uh, can you talk about your approach and, me, and also do you view your products as commodities or ingredients? Okay, I'll start off with that. I think one thing I, I tell folks a lot um, is these systems are kind of like an onion with the outer layer of the onion um, being consumed by the consumer and then every processing step further in, you know, goes deeper inside the onion. And what, what I always tell folks is if you can at all, if it's at all possible, try to get to the outer layer of the onion where the consumer is because that's where all the value is. Um, when we sell commodity corn and soybeans as a 300 acre family farm, I can tell you, last year we did all right. 2022 is pretty good year, right? Any production, production uh, farmers out there? Uh, but that's not average. Average is we get very, very, very little value um, because we're, we're the middle of the onion and we're so far removed from the consumer. Or in the, in the beer business, you know, uh, what's really cool is we kind of own the whole onion all the way out to the, uh, to the outer layer and that's where the vast majority of the value is. Um, so that's an analogy I use when I talk to other uh, farmers about you know, their ideas on, on potential um, products. I always say, hey, is there, do you think there's a realistic route all the way to the, to the end consumer? Can you transact with them? Because um, that's where the largest margin is. That's my advice on, on, on uh, vertically integrating or doing specialty crops. I think when if you have a product that you want to sell locally, if um, you really just get out there and market it, there are a lot of consumers that are interested in finding food products that are grown close to where they live. And so for us um, during the pandemic with the beef sales, that was uh, something that just kind of happened due to the nature of supply chain issues that were out there. I will say if we really made it a priority in our operation to keep up those sales, it could be a lot bigger than it is. But the diversification we have going on, we have enough balls in the air that that one has kind of fell to the wayside in terms of something that we prioritize. But on the other hand, with our cattle op business, we actually run a niche business there providing embryo transfer services to clients across um, the Midwest. And so for us, that looks like putting in uh, embryos in our cows, calving out the babies, and giving our customers back baby calves. It's like a cattle surrogate mother uh, business in that sense. And so we kind of stumbled into it, but it's really about finding a need and deciding to fill it and really making sure that you have kind of built the knowledge base around to do that. So, and this is for any of you, um, sort of a question you all addressed this a little bit, but are the small and medium sized operations going to have to go niche or go big to survive? And what are the issues with that if so? And at what point does quote going big stop? Yeah, I think 
the, the black and white answer, if I had, was forced to say something other than it's complicated, would be, yeah, yeah, I think you do. You have to special, you have to either go big or specialize. Probably so. I mean, what's happened in the last 40 years in agriculture, it's been exactly that. There are a few forces working, I think, in the other direction. We, you know, we've seen that globalization um, and scale have some disadvantages baked into them. Um, you know, eggs, uh, toilet paper, uh, baby formula. There's been a lot of examples recently where a system maybe got a little bit too one-dimensional and too efficient. Um, and hopefully there's some policy stuff, I, and I don't even, that's not my field at all, but I think there is an argument to be made. We need to think about having a little bit more robust food system, ag system, which means a lot of different producers, you know, and finding a way to keep smaller operations that are doing more, more diversified stuff. But I think that's gotta kinda come from policy. I don't think the consumer is gonna demand that. Um, they want the low price. Uh, so in, in short, I think yes, barring anything else weird happening, you kinda either gotta scale or specialize, one of the, one of the two. Well, you, you, you ask, that's a deep question. I mean, first of all, what's big and small, and where's it at in ag? I, the one thing I've, I've learned over time is we always just look at it, farmers as big and small. I've known some 80-acre farmers that grow 3,000 heads of hogs a year for their whole life, and they were big. My point is, is first of all, I think it's what we do with the productive assets we got. And in agriculture, one thing we have never done is one of the things I learned when I did a startup company. They drove it home to me, and one of the investment bankers is sitting here today. What kind of value are you creating? How am I going to extract that value? And then what percent you and I are going to keep? We always start with, we're in agriculture, we're going to sell pigs, we're going to do whatever. But we never really think about, and ultimately it's usually worth something. But big and small to me in ag today is we're big by definition. Got it? We are the food system of the U.S. So really what we ought to be thinking about, it doesn't matter if you farm 10,000 acres or 5,000 acres or 5 acres. Are you building into something that's needed by the consuming public, which most people need what we do? And how are you going to extract value out of that and how are you going to learn from it? And I think one of the biggest disservices we've done in ag, and I've been a small guy, started with 240 acres broke. Dad had cancer, mom had cancer, and it wasn't looking good. No insurance. So I was at 240 acres, and where are you going to go? And I learned. They don't really want corn at a buck fifty a bushel. So you had to start to think about how you're going to create value. And you, one of the great things about what we got is we got something that everyone wants. So I think to your ans to answer your question, I think a better understanding of what we got, what do we create, where does it fit, size doesn't really matter in the sense of the farm and everything, but it's. Focusing on the products we're, we're doing, are they relevant to the consuming public? Are we being responsible as agricultural people? And can we tell our story like we've always had in agriculture, which we've lost some of? And I think that's the way we go about it. I, sorry, I, my, tur my toes, toes kind of curl when I think about large and small. That's success, not large and small. The only thing I'll add there, and maybe it goes to growing your operation, but one thing we're seeing a lot locally is some of those smaller farmers that maybe don't think that they have a viable future on their own pooling together and joining multiple families together in kind of a collaborative operation to sustain the future and continue farming together. So this is going to be the last question, which is very self-serving. What are things you wish you could do more with universities, like the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign? And are there any barriers for growers and producers like you to work with the university? And what solutions would you suggest to achieve a deeper collaboration? I can jump in first. I think one thing that comes to mind for me is 
Maybe getting more awareness out to growers about practical application of research that universities are doing. I, I know, obviously, University of Illinois is a land-grant university that does tons of amazing things. Uh, my deeper level of understanding of all those amazing things probably stops there. And so I think being able to have more awareness about the research projects they're working on and how they practically can apply to our farming operations is one area where I would love to see more collaboration and engagement. I would say I don't, um, I don't have much of a wish list because some of the top ones we're, we're already doing. Um, the IBRL um, was mentioned earlier today uh, is an awesome resource um, and the associated lab capabilities there. We've worked with uh, fermentation, well food science started a fermentation science course and um, you know they came to us and said hey what are a couple really hard technical uh, questions you want answered um, that require this lab asset that you guys don't have, but we do. And so we went there and did it, and that was awesome. It was a perfect textbook example of how, how you can leverage, you know, uh, land-grant university to, to help a small local business. And another, another area of collaboration is we're working closely with the uh, small grain breeders here at the U of I. We've got a little test plot out at the brewery where we've got 18 different varieties of, you know, candidate grains. Um, that can be used in brewing and malting. Um, and more than that, we're also always working with them on, on what they're doing on, on their larger test plots. Um, but that's also just an awesome resource that I'm very, very lucky and, and thankful exists here. And it wouldn't exist if we, if we were somewhere else. So um, I'm, I'm going to say I think we're already hitting um, two of the biggest areas where I think uh, research university and a farm that vertically integrates into beer. I think we, the two biggest ones uh, we're already doing, so I, I don't know how much more I could ask for. Um, I think, you know, the, the ACES College and the ag community and the university to this day still is kind of a, for me, a focus of education and inspiration. I think that latter one, if you, if you can keep helping people inspire and grow and do that, that's a big deal. And I think the university still does a wonderful job of that. I think actually the U of I gets kind of a bad rap sometimes because I'll never forget, I was here a few years ago and I was involved with the IBIT program. I'll never forget this young gal who comes in, she's from Northbrook and she's in textiles. And she does this presentation out of what she learned that year through her textiles program. And we got done, and I, I was just kind of blown away. And I, I said, well, what are you going to do with this? And I, what, was, what was the biggest thing you took away? And she goes, well, I got to meet with real farmers. I was like, really? Well, that's sort of, I guess, a big deal to you. But the big thing was she took that and went on to a job in industry and agriculture. I think the ACES College is the intersection of the past and the future. And I'd always say, and I would always, if a Matt comes in and wants to figure out how to do a brewery, be certain you can meet his challenges of how he makes that the best business he can do. And that's not just people like me that have been in fert and dirt and figuring out how to plant corn. On the other hand, be certain that you still have that in your DNA that the people that come through understand what Furt and Dirt were. I think there are days I give, over the years I've given Bob Easter hell and others about, Kim, about you're not doing enough, but don't lose that. Don't lose that intersection. And it, there'll be people in agriculture that think, what are you, what are you doing that for? No, it's, it's the biggest thing that you can do in my mind. That's, they didn't pay me anything, so you can consider the source. Do we have one final comment? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jenny Webb. I'm Assistant Director of Industry Affairs for Illinois Farm Bureau. And I'd just like to take a moment to um, correct uh, your statement on Illinois Farm Bureau policy regarding solar farms. Um, we do not oppose solar farms in any way. 
Um, out of our grassroots policy book, we have, looks like 14 lines on we support under solar policy. Um, so one of those being solar energy generation as a component of the energy portfolio in the US. Our goal as a farmer-led organization is to protect private property rights when it comes to farmland. So I think what you might have been referring to is a piece of legislation um, recently that we did oppose, and that was because they were trying to propose statewide standards that did not allow um, for private property rights. So in that case, we do that to protect the farmers. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that so the audience knows our position on that, and I'd be glad to answer any questions following. Yes, thank you for that clarification. I went to the annual meeting, and you're correct. There was a lot more into my statement that I failed to outline, so I appreciate your clarification. Anything else for the greater good? All right, well, thank you so much for our panel, for taking the time and being here.